So what exactly do we mean by subsequent measurement of a lease transaction? By subsequently accounting a transaction means, well, accounting after initial recognition. So if a lease contract spans three years, the accounting entry made on day one is the initial recognition and whatever happens afterwards is the subsequent measurement. We'll come back to example of the three year lease contract but first we need a quick reminder of what we had done at initial recognition. First, as we discussed, the finance lease is initially recognized in the books of a lessor as an amount called net investment in the lease. We also discussed that net investment in the lease is simply the present value of two streams of future inflows. First is the lease payments and second is the unguaranteed residual value. Once we have reminded ourselves that net investment in the lease is the present value of what we expect to receive, it is only natural to think that these receivables will be well received. As the future cash flows pour in, they would be credited in the receivables account we opened at initial recognition. Subsequent measurement of finance lease is all about recording the receipts of the receivable from the lessee. But there is a problem. Let's get back to our three year lease to find out what it is. The future cash flows we receive would be future values in contrast to the initial recognition of the receivable which is the present value. So what do we do with the difference between a future and the present values? You probably guessed it right. It would be considered finance income of the lessor in accordance with IFR 16. Now let's look at this through a practical example. So imagine that we as lessors entered into a three year lease contract with an airline company to provide them with a supersonic airplane. The life of that plane is three years which means this is a finance lease because we are leasing out the asset for its entire life. If you are unclear about the difference between finance lease and operating lease you can find it out in our previous discussions. Links in the description. So according to the contract, the lease term is three years. At the end of every year, the lessee will pay us $100. At the end of the lease term, we would receive the asset back or whatever is left of it. And the scrap value at that time is expected to be $20. The interest rate implicit in the lease is 10%. As we present value all those amounts, $100 each year and $20 at the end of the lease term, by the interest rate implicit in the lease, we get $263.71. How do we get there? Well, we use the annuity formula to present value the stream of $100 and we can discount the unguaranteed result value of $20 individually over three years using the discount formula. Add the two together and you get number. Do you remember what this number is called? Yes. $263.71 is the net investment in the lease. Pause and think if you're not sure. Once we have this amount, we can make the lease payment schedule to separate the finance income from the payments received each year. This is crucial, so stay focused. In the standard format of lease payment schedule, the first column represents the time and of the nth year. The second column represents the lease payments to be received. Third and fourth columns represent the bifurcation of the amount received between the principal and the interest. And the fifth column is the balance still receivable. So at the start of the lease, we had a receivable worth $263.71. At the end of year one, we received $100. Out of this, some amount was interest income. So how do we compute that? Well, it's just a matter of computing simple interest. Because the receivable of $263.71 remained outstanding for one full year before the first installment was received, we only have to multiply 263.71 by 10%, which is our interest rate. This gives us 26.37, which is the amount of finance income for the first year. If 26.37 was the amount of interest in the $100 we received, the rest is naturally the repayment of principal, which is $73.63.
If from our receivable of $263.71, $73.63 have been repaid, the new balance at the end of year 1 will be $190.08. We repeat the same process for the next year except the computation of interest for the second year would be based on the new opening balance, which in our case would be 10% of $190.08, that is $19. Now at the end of the process, we still don't have a nil balance, rather it is $20. Does that remind you of anything? It sounds like the unguaranteed residual value. So why did it pop up in the end? Well, that is because the lessee never promised to consume this portion of the asset. This value of asset was never meant to be paid in cash by the lessee. This was receivable not in cash but in kind. Because we were always expecting to receive the asset worth $20, this amount was built into the computation of net investment in the lease. Now even after receiving all the cash payments, $20 is still receivable unless the lessee returns the asset as well. Also note that if the asset was never to be returned to the lesser, as part of the lease contract, this $20 would not have been included in the net investment in the lease because the lesser would have no claim on the unguaranteed residual value. Now that we have the conceptual understanding of the entire finance lease treatment in the books of the lesser, and we have worked out all the numbers that represent our balances and incomes at every stage of the lease, it is only a matter of making some ridiculously simple entries. Now, on initial recognition, de-recognize the asset in the books of the lesser and recognize the new asset which is receivable with the following entries. Debit the lease receivable by the net investment in the lease and credit the asset to de-recognize it completely. In this example we are assuming that there is no initial direct costs. On a side note, the amount by which the asset is credited is its fair value. Because this is what the lessors do, when a client approaches them, they purchase an asset from the market at fair value and extend it to the client to earn interest income. Now, do they not earn a profit upfront on this purchase and sale? Pause and think. Well, those who do that are called manufacturer or dealer lessors and IFR 16 prescribes a separate treatment for those lessors. We will deal with them in our later discussions. Back to our entries. So at the end of the first year we receive $100 from the lessee so we will debit our bank account by that amount. But what will we credit? You probably guessed it right again. $26.37 is our interest income for the first year so we would credit finance income by that amount. The remaining amount that is $73.63 will reduce our debit balance in the receivables account. So we credit that account. We can repeat the same entry for the second and the third year. Except in the last year, even after making these entries, our lease receivables account will have a balance of $20, as we just discussed. As we receive our supersonic plane back, we would debit that asset onto our balance sheet that will put the asset back onto our own balance sheet and credit the receivable by $20 which will annihilate the receivables completely. So that was Lesser's subsequent measurement of finance lease.